Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Monday, January 30th, 2023. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in God's word today, as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. For the past several days, we have been listening to Job's final speech. And really throughout all of Job's speeches, he has been maintaining his innocence. We know the backstory of Job's suffering, something that Job did not know. And so we know that Job's sufferings were not as a result of any specific evil that he had done. Job is correct in asserting his innocence. And as he concludes his speech today in Job chapter 31, he summarizes that assertion of his innocence. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a young woman? For what portion would I have from God above, or what inheritance from the Almighty on high? Doesn't disaster come to the unjust and misfortune to evildoers? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked in falsehood, or my foot has rushed to deceit, let God weigh me on accurate scales, and he will recognize my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, my heart has followed my eyes, or impurity has stained my hands, let someone else eat what I have sown, and let my crops be uprooted. If my heart has gone astray over a woman, or I have lurked at my neighbor's door, let my own wife grind grain for another man, and let other men sleep with her. For that would be a disgrace. It would be an iniquity deserving punishment. For it is a fire that consumes down to a badden. It would destroy my entire harvest. If I have dismissed the case of my male or female servants when they made a complaint against me, what could I do when God stands up to judge? How should I answer him when he calls me to account? Did not the one who made me in the womb also make them? Did not the same God form us both in the womb? If I have refused the wishes of the poor or let the widow's eyes go blind, if I have eaten my few crumbs alone without letting the fatherless eat any of it, for from my youth I raised him as his father, and since the day I was born I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone dying for lack of clothing or a needy person without a cloak, if he did not bless me while warming himself with the fleece from my sheep, if I ever cast my vote against a fatherless child when I saw that I had support in the city gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my back and my arm be pulled from its socket. For disaster from God terrifies me, and because of his majesty, I could not do these things. If I placed my confidence in gold or called fine gold my trust, if I have rejoiced because my wealth is great, or because my own hand has acquired so much. If I have gazed at the sun when it was shining, or at the moon moving in splendor, so that my heart was secretly enticed and I threw them a kiss, this would also be an iniquity deserving punishment, for I would have denied God above. Have I rejoiced over my enemy's distress or become excited when trouble came his way? I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life with a curse. Haven't the members of my household said, Who is there who has not had enough to eat at Job's table? No stranger had to spend the night on the street, for I opened my door to the traveler. Have I covered my transgressions as others do, by hiding my iniquity in my heart? Because I, because I greatly feared the crowds and because the contempt of the clans terrified me, so I grew silent and would not go outside. If only I had someone to hear my case. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my opponent compose his indictment. I would surely carry it on my shoulder and wear it like a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. I would approach him like a prince. If my land cries out against me and its furrows join in weeping, if I have consumed its produce without payment or shown contempt for its tenants, then let thorns grow instead of wheat, and stinkweed instead of barley. The words of Job are concluded.
Yesterday, at the end of Paul's first letter to the Christians in Corinth, we heard Paul announce his plan to travel to Corinth to visit the Christians there. When Paul wrote that first letter to the Christians in Corinth, he was staying in Ephesus. And so it would not have been difficult for him to travel over to Corinth from Ephesus. However, it turns out that Paul had a change of plans. Instead of traveling directly east to Corinth from Ephesus, Paul traveled north to Troas and then across to uh, Macedonia, which would have still been north of Corinth. When Paul was in Macedonia, he received a report from Titus, who had come from Corinth, telling Paul uh, good news that a lot of the problems that had, uh, had arisen in the congregation in Corinth had been taken care of. It was then that Paul wrote what we're going to start reading today, his second letter to the Christians in Corinth. Paul has three purposes for writing this letter. The first, we're going to see uh, him start addressing in our reading for today. Uh, the, it would seem that the Christians in Corinth were very troubled by the fact that Paul had a change of travel plans. And so Paul spends the first part of his letter explaining why he had that change in travel plans. The second part of his letter then goes on to talk about finishing the collection that we heard him talk about at the end of the first letter to the Christians in Corinth. Uh, this was a collection for the uh, Christians in Jerusalem who were experiencing great poverty. And so Paul gives some really wonderful instruction on Christian stewardship and the management of the uh, physical resources that we receive from God. The third section of Paul's second letter to the Christians in Corinth uh, is a defense of his apostleship. We saw already in the first letter that Paul wrote to the congregation in Corinth that there was opposition among certain parties in that congregation toward Paul. That opposition still was continuing as Paul wrote this second letter. And so Paul de uh, defends his ministry against the ministry of the so-called super apostles that were stirring up opposition against Paul. And so we start with chapter one today as Paul talks about why he had to change his travel plans. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will also share in the comfort. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed, beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again while you join in helping us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gifts that came to us through the prayers of many. Indeed, this is our boast. The testimony of our conscience is that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you, with godly sincerity and purity, not by human wisdom, but by God's grace. For we are writing nothing to you other than what you can read and also understand. I hope you will understand completely, just as you have partially understood us, that we are your reason for pride, just as you are also ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. 
Because of this confidence, I planned to come to you first so that you could have a second benefit and to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then come to you again from Macedonia and be helped by you on my journey to Judea. Now, when I planned this, was I of two minds? Or what I plan, do I plan in a purely human way so that I say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus, Timothy, and I, did not become yes and no. On the contrary, in him it is always yes. For every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, through him we also say amen to the glory of God. Now it is God who strengthens us together with you in Christ and who has anointed us. He has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a down payment. I call on God as a witness on my life that it was to spare you that I did not come to Corinth. I do not mean that we lord it over your faith, but we are workers with you for your joy because you stand firm in your faith. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in God's word today. May the Lord richly bless your day. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.